Hey everybody, welcome back to the Combo Couch. I am Fiorella Isabel. And I'm Pasta Jardula. And we're here with Gloria Lariva, who is running for president. And she is a socialist and she's running under the Peace and Freedom Party. Gloria, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me on. Uh, we're we're really excited because, well, I specifically am excited. I consider myself um, a, a socialist. Um, and we have two horrible candidates right now. And a lot of people have been looking for different outlets, whether it's the Green Party, whether it's Peace and Freedom, whether it's independence running, um, even libertarians. People have been looking because the options are so bad. But many people have been chastised and belittled and vote shamed for considering to not vote for anybody like Joe Biden. I live in California, obviously, so I don't um, there's really no reason to vote for Joe Biden. But um, let's talk a little bit about why you're running. And we're going to ask you a couple questions on on the state of affairs. So how difficult has it been to be in a party like Peace and Freedom? That's a third party that doesn't have ballot access in many states. I know you have ballot access in 13 states, possibly one more in Rhode Island soon. But uh, tell me the challenges of running a campaign like that. Well, first of all, I'm running for the Party for Socialism and Liberation across the country. In most well, states. first of all, I'm in running for the Party for Socialism. I'm an independent. They don't allow for new parties right now. In California, I am on the Peace and Freedom Party, which is okay. I think the most significant state in terms of electoral votes or the population. It's the biggest state of the country, population-wise. And I will be on in 14 states. But regardless, you know, aside from the issue of ballot status, which is very overwhelming for third parties like ourselves, is that more than two years now, we've seen the Democratic race go from the 30 candidates, 25, 10, finally to one, Joe Biden. But there's been a lot of focus on the Democratic Party candidates. Everyone knew who they all were for two years. With Trump, he's the president. And so you know who the Republican is going to be. For the third parties, it's actually now winding up the ballot status or the ballot access requirements. For example, our deadline for Rhode Island is September 4th. But most balloting... Uh, work is done in June, July, August. And so then you have 12 weeks max to do your campaigning. And then aside from that is the media, despite the fair and equal coverage that's required by federal law, I've never been on national television and I've been a candidate before. Uh, the Greens, they hardly got anything. Uh, Jill Stein got a little bit, but it's an overwhelming preponderance of the Democrats and Republicans. Why? Because it's their elections. Yeah. It's their system. And so they have to make sure that the stability, whether it's one party or the other, that it has to remain in place. That's why they crushed the candidacy of Bernie Sanders, even though he was running on the Democratic Party ticket. Just the idea of calling for health care and education, student uh, cancellation for students, and the right to housing, that was a no starter for the Democrats. The Democrats. And so they saw to it that he was roundly defeated before Super Tuesday on March 3rd. Well, what? Uh, my question is do you have more to say, Gloria, on that? Or yeah, and so nonetheless, sorry. so why are we running? Why do we bother? Yeah. Because there are so many people who, the vast majority of people believe in the election, even though half the electorate that can vote doesn't vote, generally, sometimes even more than half, who say, why bother? Nothing changes. And they're right. In essence, nothing really changes. But everyone is paying close attention. This is a battle taking place more than ever between Democrat and Republican as the only choice people are told they have. So we have to insert ourselves in that. As socialists, uh, we don't run to say, wow, if we just work harder for another 50 years, eventually we might win. And then maybe we'll give you change. We say that the only change comes from the people organizing, mobilizing, fighting for justice, fighting for our rights. That's what US history shows us. And the elections are an important arena to inject us, <clears throat> to inject ourselves in. And Aside from elections, we're very involved in the campaigns. We've been doing 
nationally canceled events campaigns, caravans in the midst of the pandemic, making political demands that if people were able to hear, they would be for it. And no matter what the outcome of the election, those ideas will carry, will carry forward. And the dissatisfaction, the continued economic crisis, the pandemic catastrophe, the environmental destruction that's going on that could make life unviable if we don't stop it. All of these are, will be looming on November 3rd. You know, I think a lot of people in California are looking desperately for that opportunity to vote for a third party. And I'm glad you're joining us here to talk about your ideas. But while we're on the Democratic Party, as far as considering the Republican Party and where they're at, don't you think the Democratic Party has actually move backwards since 2016. I mean, nothing has changed. Uh, and in this time, I mean, we didn't have WikiLeaks to give us information about, you know, them rigging the election, but there has been zero transparency in their election. And a lot of things that's very hard for the Democrats to explain as far as how they got all these votes for Joe Biden, especially in a state like California, where he didn't even come to campaign. I mean, he wasn't at any of the conventions. So what is your opinion about the current state of affairs of the Democratic and Republican Party? And more importantly, do you think the Democrats have moved forward or backwards since 2016? I think they've gone rightward since, uh, you could even say since Jimmy Carter. The, but, but most definitely since, I think there's a sharp turn to the right with Bill Clinton. It was Bill Clinton who signed many, many laws, first of all, uh, that eliminated much of welfare rights for poor people, especially women. He increased the possibility of the death penalty being applied, wiped out habeas corpus for federal inmates, federal defendants, and passed the effective death penalty and anti-terrorism law, which was yeah. horrible in the criminal justice, passed the laws that led to mass incarceration, a real spike in his term. And on the international front, he was the main uh, person who headed up the sanctions, a euphemism for blockade of Iraq. I went to Iraq three times in the 90s while he was president, when over a million and a half people died, not from the bombing, which killed a quarter of a million, but from the complete blockade of the country, killing no. babies, women, older people, in fact, I remember one time I, I have a video that I made that won second prize for an international film festival, uh, Genocide by Sanctions, The Case of the Rock. And I have at one point a video where he says, there are those who want to end the sanctions. I am not among them. And it stayed all the way through George Bush and the bombing. But Clinton was a, a sharp turn to the right. There was the end of what you would call liberalism it continued with um, Obama, 2016, I mean, 2008, 2009. And Obama yeah. warned in his, president, in his presidential campaign that he would do away with the leftist, progressive governments in Latin America, which is exactly what happened. It wasn't, uh, he had, I call it, uh, the iron fist in a velvet glove. And yeah, yeah. Well, more political, more sophisticated, and yet just as imperialist as George Bush. Yeah. So hey, before Fiora, I'm so sorry, ask that question, answer question, but I just want to say that lovely list of everything you gave, I don't want to forget about the repeal of Glass-Steagall too as well, which oh, Clinton was very important what's coming up. And I just wanted to add that to that list because everything you said there just hit so home. I'm sorry, fam, go ahead. Um, so what is your opinion on how the United States has handled the coronavirus pandemic. Obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic, also economic uncertainty. How do you feel uh, that was handled and how uh, would you suggest something like this should have been handled? I think any honest person who knows that it is a pandemic, who doesn't say it's fake, would understand, knows that it's a complete disaster what the government did. I think I consider him a mass murderer for joking about it, mocking scientists, mocking doctors, continuing to say that, you know, we saw that we saw this circus, this very cruel circus of claiming it'll disappear, refusing to wear a mask. And what was it all for? In the very, very beginning, it's interesting that people for the first time in the US, most people 
learned about the Defense Production Act. The Defense Production Act, which was uh, passed, made law in 19, in the early years of the Korean War, the three-year war that involved massive carpet bombing of the North and destruction in the South as well by the US and the UN under the cover of the UN. But the Defense Production Act said that the government has the power to harness all the productive capacity of the United States to produce weapons. That was what the law was about. But even, even, oh, even um, Trump mentioned it and then it passed. What he used it for was to order the meatpacking workers to get back to work, even though they were dying of COVID in the factories because it's so close together, no masks, no, off, no appropriate protection, and the huge speed up for the meat, the pork, beef, chicken industry that led many of them to their deaths because the profits had to be continued. The executive orders that he passed um, during the pandemic, and we have what, 179,000 people who've died in the United States. You have Cuba with less than 90 people who've died because they have a socialist government and free healthcare. But at the same time, we have to remember, he's a, he wants to dismantle Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and yet Biden refuses to acknowledge that we need national healthcare. We're, it's between a rock and a hard place yep. in the grip of a vice of the profit-making system that we live in, where the health insurance companies are the ones who deny you care as long as their profit is, is at risk. And that's what we're in the middle of right now. Uh, the fact that 50 million people lost their jobs in this pandemic. And they, even if many got their job back or got another job, they still don't have the health care. It, it's, it's, it's horrific what we're living right now. And so you ask me, what do I think of what's taking place? What do I think should happen? Our campaign says there's still time to rescue the situation even though many people have died, is again, take over those industries where the workers would be very happy to help produce the things that we need, to have healthcare available for all under emergency order right now, that every hospital, every clinic be open and no one have to pay a penny or have to show your insurance coverage. And tell people, you have the freedom to see a doctor. You have the right to go in and say, I don't feel well build the hospitals, you know, there's a lot of construction workers, you know, stop the building of these uh, con condominium and office high rises. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee right now. And if someone told me when I came in here a week ago, we have more cranes lifting up all the means of the production for these high rises going up than any other city in the country. Uh, the newly built towers, whether Seattle, San Francisco, New York, or Nashville, they're lying empty while people who are homeless are in the street. And if you walk through the streets of any city, I'm sure you have, there are the homeless don't have any access to bathrooms. It's harder for them to eat. It, it, it's just shocking what people are suffering through. All this could be overcome, even under capitalism. If the executive took the power that he has, whether it's Trump again, or Biden, they have the power to declare emergency yeah. and help the people, the working class, not only those who are working and lost their jobs, don't have health care, but those who never had an opportunity. Sam, do you have a follow up? No, go ahead. Um, okay, so let's stick on this topic right now because sometimes, like, you know, myself, I can get a little criticism because I have no problem with people getting into the streets when it comes to dealing with the police brutality and the systemic racism that's there. However, I sometimes get frustrated because I don't feel the movement sometimes addresses the economic inequality. For instance, the CARES Act, which provided no help for renters, it gave very little to workers, whatnot. And whether we like it or not, you can almost say that the CARES Act will kill hundreds of thousands of people and throw them out in the street. And sometimes I get frustrated because we're not addressing those issues right there and the politicians that are allowing that to happen. So in your opinion, how do we address the systemic racism within the police department, the brutality that's going on, while also addressing the economic inequality and the bills that really help 
the workers in which you say you want to protect. Yeah, thank you so much, Pasta, because the, the issue of, of the racism and the police brutality, the uprising has taken place since George Floyd's horrific murder. I do still think that those are very essential. We shouldn't discount the power of it in affecting not only the fight against racism and the fight to say, stop the war on black America, but also that uh, black people and Latinos are the ones who are affected the most by the pandemic, the most by economic crisis, suffer the greatest levels of poverty in addition to indigenous people. Uh, I think it's good to inject the politics into the anti-racist protest, but it's happening. I've been in Portland, I've been in Seattle, I've been in San Francisco, Oakland, I've been here in Tennessee in the demonstration. I've been everywhere in those mass protests. I was in Ferguson during the uprising against the killing of Mike Brown. But people do talk about all of that. People do talk about the economics. I think the problem is, is that the Democrats, who are the other half of the electoral machinery, they don't take, say anything about it. How can you be a candidate who says nothing about health care and says, I'm going to fix Obamacare? I'm going to fix Obamacare. Or does not say anything about jobs? We're in the middle of the worst crisis that could ever be imagined. Remember how the graph was like the highest level of jobless claims in the history of this country was 650,000. Then you had one and a half million five, seven, then finally 50 million in the space of weeks. And it's not being addressed. And at the same time, it's not just poverty that we're seeing. It's the most obscene accumulation of wealth ever. Of the five corporations, Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, and the others, that they've, they've gotten hundreds of billions of dollars in profit because of the pandemic and that paid almost no taxes. Amazon, everyone knows you talk in the street. I talk to people, they go, yeah, Amazon didn't pay taxes last year. At the same time, people will say, but how do we pay for all this? How do we pay for everything that you're saying? How are we going to pay for healthcare and housing and jobs? Uh, take those companies over. Yep. And even even you don't have to be a socialist. Nice. <laughs> you don't have to be a socialist. You could say, take those profits over of the companies that already have hundreds of billions of dollars. You benefited from this. It grew your wealth. Take everything you've taken from the people in this pandemic. Workers who can't even organize for a union in Amazon or Whole Foods. You know, they have these cameras that detect whether the workers in Whole Foods are gathering together, the heat sensors to say, are they meeting each other? I'm, I'm, I've met with a lot of these workers who have their schedules shifted all the time because the billionaires and the trillionaires, because there are trillionaires now, they never have enough profit. They wanna make sure they never pay taxes again. Who pays taxes if they don't? We do. We pay taxes in the form of parking tickets, the lottery to finance state budgets, uh, city budgets, and cutbacks. So, Gloria, given the state of, of the way things are, what is your uh, number one issue if you had to choose uh, an issue? Well, maybe let's put it this way. What would I do if I were president in a theoretical sense? What could be done right now? Uh, you see how many executive orders Trump signed. The, Dem the Democrats and Republicans previously, but especially the Democrats who had the majority for two years under Clinton and the majority for two years under Obama. Why did nothing happen? Why did nothing happen? Because they kept saying we need bipartisanship. That myth of like, if we just get our two parties together, we can make a lot of progress. They just sat on things. They have the majority of the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and they did nothing, which then ended up really allowing Bush to win and Trump to win, right? right. When nothing happened and the dissatisfaction of the voting population said, well, screw you. We'll go for the Republicans. They're talking jobs. 
because Trump talked jobs while Clinton ignored Ohio, Pennsylvania, and other other states that previously in the past had been Democrat. I'm, I'm talking a little bit about the past to understand what they didn't do when they had the power. When the Republicans came in, they're like, uh, out of the way, because we rule now and we're going to take back everything we want. Uh, so what would we do? I think the issue is economics. Economics to heal uh, all the working class. And by the way, in my campaign and that of the party that I represent, PSL, Peace and Freedom, and in Vermont, Liberty Union Party, which is a socialist party in Vermont and it nominated me, we call for reparations for the black and native communities. And some people go, how do you pay for it? The same thing I said about the corporations that pay no taxes. The black community is in the straits that they're in with one tenth of the wealth that the average white family owns, which usually has the ownership of a house, car, property. It doesn't mean that they're rich, but they have stability of a home. In the black community, where it's about 170,000 for a white, at the white family average, it's 17,000. And you know you can't own a house with $17,000. That's the average for the black community. And it's not because they didn't work hard. It's because slavery was, you're going to build the wealth of this country, but you're going to have nothing. And afterwards, you're going to have even less because we're going to take it back from you after Reconstruction was defeated. And then the prisons were created and filled with black people who were like, we're going to drag you back into prison and you're going to become a peon. You're going to, you're going to create the wealth. You're going to grow the cotton in Texas. The history of the United States, the black code laws. People don't realize that President Woodrow Wilson eliminated all black employment in Washington, DC. There were many black workers in the federal jobs of Washington at the turn of the century. And they were all fired. Do people know that? So that anytime black people made a gain, it was taken away. Tulsa, Oklahoma, and all these other massacres occurred, the burning down of Black Wall Street on Greenwood, in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, the 100th anniversary coming up. This, this history must be known. Yeah, a, and lot, then, a lot of people don't know it. So thank you for- Yeah, knowing. and so reparations is a way of saying, we've got to return back what was stolen all these decades, not just because of slavery. The, so, for example, do you know, do you know that the, the issue of the GI Bill, which was a, a great progress for the working class up until that point, white workers also were not considered to be having the right to college. Well, many went to college. Many older people I know went to college, but black people didn't. They were pretty much kept out. The redlining of housing and social security. There's an interesting article from the 1619 Project of the New York Times, which shows that even though social security was this historic achievement, radical reform for the people to be able to have some income after they retired, most black people at that time in the 30s were in jobs that did not accumulate social security. Up until that point had no right to it. And afterwards did not have, it was like domestic work or the kind of jobs that did not accumulate social security taxation. So it's a long story, yeah. but reparations is essential. And for, the, and for the native community, which lives in the poorest counties of the country, in Pine Ridge Reservation, which is the poorest county of the country. The average wage there is between $2,600 and $3,500 a year. And I was there in January and saw the devastation from that. What, what do you say to people though, just as a follow-up, who say that, well, right now the white working class is suffering a lot and is, uh, uh, they feel like it's not fair that they're not getting anything in return and they feel victimized that uh, black people and native people might be getting reparations. How do you handle that type of attitude? Well, first I would explain some of these issues, but also to say, it's not like they're getting anything either. Black people aren't getting anything. Native people aren't getting anything. And white people are also suffering. I'm a, I'm a great proponent 
that all the people of this country need help. And I think that what we need is unity. We need unity in the streets against racism. We need unity in the streets against any police killing. Because many white people are killed, but somehow in the, in the, in, in, among white people, there's not this movement of demanding justice. Uh, and so I think it's one of the greatest developments in our country to see so many white youth fighting racism because it helps everyone to fight police brutality. Yeah. They, you know, there was a white man the other day, the police were, two police were finally arrested because they tased a white man 50 times. They murdered him. How do you, how do you tase someone 50 times unless you're a, a masochistic murderer? As we see 20 of them get rid of, get away with murder. I was in the, Northern California, I live in San Francisco. And was it this year or last year? I mean, the blending of seasons in California. You can't tell what season you're in. It's always warm in California. But anyway, it was horrific. It was on television. It was in Santa Rosa. And a, a white worker had his car stall, jet, carjacked. He reported it. A little bit later, he finds the car abandoned. He gets in his car. He's driving to, to go report it, that it was found. The police see the car and they go, ah, this man stole the car. They open the door. This is on camera. And he goes, but it's my car. He goes, get out. It's my car. And the, the cop grabs his head and crushes his head against the door jam. You hear the, his head crack. He died. But you don't. So I'm back to the youth, black and white youth fighting together and, and other youth as well. The thing about white people, there are, the average is one hundred seventy thousand dollars in wealth, but how many millions have nothing as well? In the South, North, East, West, white people also are suffering. So yeah. we've got to not fall for that idea that, oh, why do they get something and we don't? You know, I, I have a friend, a dear, 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 dear friend of mine who has very progressive ideas, but. Um, we were talking about the thing about health care and, and this person said, you know, my child is working and he's working and working. He gets no health care. So why do people who don't work get health care? And I said, there's room for everyone to have every need met. The point is we got to fight for all of it, economic justice for all, and look at the real enemy. The capitalists were stealing from us every day by low wages, unemployment, layoffs. You know, I, I like to say this to people who don't understand why socialism is the answer when they think actually that the poor are the problem. I say um, everything you wear or consume, everything you use, look around you from a car to your phone to the food you eat, everything is now produced in modern society in the world by the hands of tens of thousands of workers, whether it's your shirt, the cotton, grown, sewn, retailed, shipped across the world. Everything is produced by the hand of thousands of workers in social production. The problem with capitalism is it's private ownership. And so you have the wealth concentrated more and more in monopoly that becomes so obscene that Wal the Walton family of Walmart owns as much as 62 million families, maybe more now with the concentration of wealth, that six trillionaires own half of the world's wealth. So the problem is the private ownership. And they're the dictatorship that decides, my profits aren't high enough. I'm shutting down the factory. They rule over you. So what's the answer? Take away the private ownership? And the production continues because the workers know how to run everything. We run everything. We just don't own it. In that ownership of socialism, we would then be able to say, okay, rather than building nuclear weapons, we're stopping that. And those workers will have education or an income until they have a new job. All the need of revamping water delivery systems in every town of America, because they're mostly still lead pipes, Rebuild that with millions of workers. 
the women and the fathers who need childcare make it free and give all these people who would love to take care of children in a proper childcare a decent job. There would be a labor shortage under socialism because so much has to be redone in a sustainable way and not producing just to make a profit like the new phone. Every year you gotta have a new gimmick or um, you know, oil, fracking, cars. We need mass transit. So I think-, I think it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, one more thing. I think when people understand what capitalism really is and who the, and what the real dictatorship is of capitalism and that to have confidence in ourselves as workers, you talk to any worker in a job and they know the boss can like disappear and you're still going to go to work and you still know how to do things. Yeah. You know, I think it was a great time to have you on the show. <laughs> it really is. What you just said there resonated so uh, uh, hard because it's a very nuanced situation. There's so many things going on. And I always talk about the economics. And you know, I never want to sound like I'm lacking compassion to say that race isn't an issue. But, you know, there's an argument going out there right now. And if you say you stand for reparations, aren't you actually saying that economics play a big part to the divide that's going on? Because we have a lot of poor, uneducated people now in one country. When you strip, you know, poor people of resources, they start blaming people who don't look like them for their problems. So by saying that reparations are a big solution, aren't we saying? I'm not saying it's the only solution, but I think that the economics are a big solution to a lot of our problems when it comes to race issues in this country. Well, reparations are an essential element of economics for Black people. And for Native people. But, you know, nothing stays the same. It goes backwards or forwards. But right now, things are going forward in terms of the struggle taking place and the consciousness that's changing. Um, there are even polls right now in the big media that are showing that as a result of the uprising taking place since George Floyd, that the majority of white people now, in fact, close to 70%, which it was, it was not that way before, recently, are saying, yes, racism is a problem and police brutality is a problem. And I think that it's a great, great change. Like I said, the youth, white youth, there are those who will try to divide still. They use a tactic of divide and conquer. But I think the unity is more hopeful now because of the struggle. Um, the media will try to change it. They'll try to put in another narrative, but we must not lose hope. And the economics, you know, again, if you point out the unbelievable wealth and the profit-making of the corporations, everybody knows that Amazon is just going skyrocketing. Everybody knows we're beholden to them. We're beholden to a lot of these corporations. And if people understand how much they've made, which is not a secret, it's in there in the media. But if we point out that's the problem, not your neighbor, not the black community, not what we're demanding. And if we show that all of that wealth is not charity and show that you as a worker, look how much you make for the company. But, but that's not a mystery for people right now. I've been in Walmart. I've actually petitioned with my comrades in, inside Walmart. We would walk around and tell people, hi, I'm, you know, I'm petitioning. And, and the workers will say, yeah, this is really terrible. We make hardly anything. I make $12 an hour. I make $10 an hour. Um, you know, people in some of these states still make $7.25 an hour. So it's education and it's political visibility. The, that's the role of a socialist party. That's the role of a socialist candidate. And we're fighting for media coverage. We, we have to fight for um, television coverage. But there was a bigger, bigger, bigger element in helping reach the people that was unexpected four years ago and this year. That was Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie Sanders, we had the benefit of that 
the movement had the benefit of the fact that he called himself a socialist. Now there were contradictions because he has voted for the war budget before. He has supported certain wars. Uh, he has certain contradictions, but overwhelmingly his call four years ago of healthcare, education, the right to housing and jobs was open the door for us. And I was a candidate four years ago as well. And the thing that changed from all my previous participation in election campaigns was that people started to say, well, what do you mean by socialism and what is it? And they wouldn't turn you away. They would actually take your flyer. They would actually listen. This year, the last two years, and especially under Trump, many young people are joining as socialists. I think it's very, very hopeful. And those youth influence their families. And it's also a bigger sign. They may be more inclined to become active, but I think a lot of people are asking about socialism. And also they see that capitalism isn't working for them. How can we not see that? I mean, think of the 178, 79,000 that have died. Think of their families who lost a loved one who maybe was a bread earner or just a loved one in their family. How many people are silent, silenced, whose suffering is just not there for us to know about? Not just the people who died, but the people who are sick now. How many people are saying, we need a way out of this? So the activists, not just socialists, housing rights activists, Unions, unionists, the postal workers, the community, we have our job cut out for us. And I think that the unity is greater than ever among us, among those who have the politics and the vision to influence tens, if not tens of millions of people. I think that, I think we're seeing that there's a sea change underneath that's eventually going to rise up with not just Black Lives Matter protests, which again, I think are very critical, but the mass is coming out and saying, enough, I'm not leaving my home, you're not kicking me out. And I think yeah. that's the big challenge, is housing. Yep. <clears throat> so, Sam, you want me to? Yeah, so how would you, uh, it's kind of switching into more of the intelligence and foreign policy, how would you combat the uh, ever, powerful military industrial complex and the CIA um, because a lot of the times you know presidents like Obama promise they he ran like he was as a socialist or somebody that was going to bring change um, and we know that the two-party system keeps them in line it doesn't matter who's president they seem beholden to the military industrial complex and, and that power so how would you be able to combat that it seems almost insurmountable well, I think certainly I'm an, I'm an anti-war activist of many, many years, and there are many, many people who are involved in anti-war. Uh, right now, it's necessary for the movement to not get diverted by the accusations of the Democrats, for example, of the last four years, which really was one of their biggest ploys for trying to defeat Trump on Russiagate, accusing Russia of getting Trump elected, which was so bogus and so outrageous and so confusing for people and was an abandonment of the economic issues they should have been fighting and didn't. Or now uh, accusing China. Uh, Trump has certainly carried out sanctions against China because the capitalists that he represents, the imperialists, don't want China to be this economic powerhouse in the world that they are. Like Huawei, oh, let's ban Huawei. Well, guess what? Other countries are buying up that technology because you're just far behind. The, yeah. the capitalist answer to they're losing their share of the world market or their share of the economy in the world is blockade, sanctions, and war. And that's capitalism. That's what you, happens when you are the most powerful militarized country in the world is you, is you use your power to try to smash other countries. But even countries like Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, North Korea, countries that are not in the orbit of the imperialist world 
and have chosen a different life like Cuba and Venezuela as socialists or, or trying to fight for socialism in the case of Venezuela, they are the biggest targets right now in Latin America, started again by Obama. He restarted that war against um, those countries, notwithstanding the fact that he lifted the block, not lifted the blockade. He began diplomatic relations with Cuba. But the what we would do, what I think what we call for right now is the immediate lifting of the blockade on Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, North Korea, all the 70 countries that the U.S. is blockading right now or has some sort of sanctions on China as well. That's not the way to go. Do people even know that Cuba and Russia have vaccines now? They have yeah. vaccines and they have very effective medical treatment. Um, but the U.S. is using the opportunity right now to try to kill the Cuban revolution. It's so cruel. It's horrendous what's happening right now. On the issue of war, we call for the shutting down of all U.S. bases in the world, the 800 bases that are that constant democracy sword, however you pronounce it, over the heads of the people. In a particular case is Korea. Korea would have been unified long ago if it wasn't for the tens of thousands of U.S. troops in the South. Mm -hmm. ready at any moment to have war against the North. Yep. And they're preparing for that war because the war exercises around the peninsula. The drills, yep. That are, like they openly say, we're going to decapitate the leader of North Korea. They, the head of the military says that before they launch their twice a year military exercises. We don't know about that. So that's why we say without hesitation, shut down all U.S. bases, shut down the Pentagon, you, you know the arsenal that the U.S. has right now? And yet that $780 billion a year that the Democrats added even more to this year, I think $50 billion more than Trump even asked for. And they don't count, by the way, the nuclear weapons industry. The nuclear weapons industry is under the Department of Energy budget. So it's more than a trillion dollars. And under Obama, he signed that trillion dollar, was it $2 trillion dollar? over 10 years development of tactical nuclear weapons that they said you can dial down the power so it's not as destructive as Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, that was an <laughs> atomic bomb. The Trident missiles on the Trident submarines, 256 warheads on each submarine, each one is far more powerful than anything that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's the military power of the U.S. That's what Obama adding to all the previous presidents did in building the nuclear arsenal to say, we will build weapons that we can use, not against nuclear powers, but against countries that don't have nuclear weapons. Not mm -hmm. just first strike, but only strike. We're the only ones who have that power to do it. And we'll use them. Yeah. You know, I mean, my, uh, my partners over here watch uh, Crimson Tide not too long ago because I wanted them to see, because I had a, a short stint in the Navy about how powerful these weapons are that they cause nuclear holocaust it's like it's it's to me it is the most important pressing issue that day one i would want our president to sit down and talk to china and russia but that being said how would you approach the china and russia situation when the leaders in uh, putin and xi jinping are so demonized in the united states uh, and people are so clueless about what that society is like and what's going on and what the leaders have done for their countries. How would you push past that uh, and, and uh, tell the people, um, convince the people of America that we need to sit down and talk with our frenemies to get rid of these nuclear weapons? Well, I think just on the basis of countering what was done in the last four years about demonizing Russia was to really show how absurd it was to accuse Russia of having influenced the elections. Or actually, they were also saying that Black Lives Matter, uh, the, the intelligence of the US, the CIA was saying that Black Lives Matter was uh, a creation of Russia, that they helped foment this, this discontent. Really? You mean civil rights and all that struggle against apartheid USA was not something, was, did, did Russia do that too? Anyway, but to, to say 
generally we need peace and people need peace just on the basics people need peace we don't want war we have too many wars going on the u.s is occupying other countries and there's no money for jobs at home there's no money for housing but we can destroy other countries i mean i think that essence is not it is very basic and necessary because people don't get that yet they have to hear that anti-war voice and there have been i mean the U.S. has gotten away with war after war lately, but they actually haven't won those wars. They've just destroyed countries. And I think that the Pentagon has been very skilled since Vietnam. Only those of us who are older understand that. Younger people don't see what the history of the Pentagon has been since Vietnam. That the Vietnam to a large degree the war was defeated because of the rage in the, within the military, the U.S. military, and the population, which was fed up. Of course, the Vietnamese resistance was the greatest factor. But since that time, the Pentagon made sure that the news couldn't cover all of what was going on on the ground in Vietnam. That was a big factor. I remember as a kid seeing the troops, like, just their, just how the war, the horror of the war and the massacre at My Lai and all that. Now you don't see anything in the media. That's our challenge, you guys. Our challenge is fighting ever since the Iraq first, the Gulf War in 1991 that we were very active in. Nobody saw what the U.S. was doing to Iraq. Yeah. And so, it, and the fact that no troops died because it was a bombing war from above. These wars now have not been troops on the ground fighting more equivalency a more of an equivalent war it's it's a it's a war from above of just bombing countries to smithereens i was in yugoslavia by the way twice during the bombing war of 1999 i was there twice well three times actually with ramsey clark the great humanitarian anti-war leader who used to be attorney general under president johnson but I went with him for five days in March, and I went with him again for five days in May, after 55 days of bombing. And we were there during the act of war for 10 days total to see the absolute destruction. So my role, along with Ramsey, was to bring that back. I mean, that's the role of anti-war activists, to show to the American public what the U.S. is doing in our name, without our consent, but in our name, as if we're for that. So I brought back a video that got great, you know, great coverage and, and distribution. In 1991, the bombing war of Iraq and the sanctions that killed a million and a half people. I went to Iraq three times and brought back an award-winning film called Genocide by Sanctions. And it, it, it reached many, many audiences. To be sure, the sanctions continued for 12 years. The power of the military of the U.S. is is tremendous, it's huge, it's overwhelming, but it can't continue like that forever because I think mm. people are fed up with war right now. Yeah. I think what's really sad though is how many hundreds of thousands of US soldiers suffered amputations, horrible injuries, brain injury and psychological damage and who are really getting no help. No help really. Yeah, yeah. But they're invisible, you see. And yeah. another thing that the Pentagon did that was so skillful on their part was to fashion this phenomenon of making parents in the Iraq war, the second war, because the first one, there was no almost no casualty at all. I mean, really virtually nothing. But in Afghanistan and the, and the, and the occupation of Iraq was that if parents were against the war, they were made to feel that they were against their kids. So the, the, the families have been very silenced and only one woman made an impact and that was Cindy Sheehan, who camped out, camped out in front of George Bush's vacation home in, in Crawford, Texas. And she stood up, but she was demonized. Yeah. So I'm talking about a scenario of the challenges we face. But again, this is all breaking up. The idea that capitalism is superior 
and that you can't question it. It will always be. And it's the only thing you can hope for is just vote and hope for change. It's breaking up now with the resistance that we're seeing in our country and the resistance that we're seeing of other peoples. Mm -hmm. so China, like Russia is part of that anti-war. Um, we don't want war with China. We don't want war with Russia. Yeah. And to find the skill to, to work with that and explain. It's not about China being a challenge or a threat. Yeah. It's about their, their economic uh, superiority in many ways. It angers the capitalists. They're not yeah. our enemy. So uh, regarding that, though, um, you talk about uh, voting. Uh, our elections don't really seem fair. Um, we've been following the elections in, um, well, 2016, we saw what happened in, during the primary with Bernie Sanders. Um, and then 2020 congressional races as well. Are our elections, uh, like, what would you do to help w revamp our elections? Because I think we're in serious need of election reform. I think we're in serious need of having election integrity. We don't own the machines. The, the machines aren't public. They're owned by private entities. There are still issues with both Democrats and Republicans with voter suppression. How would you combat that? Because I feel like if we, the reason people don't vote is also because they feel like their vote doesn't count or it doesn't matter. People get selected to be president. How do you, how do we redo our whole election system? That's a good question. There are many aspects to the issue of voter rights. And first of all, we know that the Supreme Court weakened the Voting Rights Act uh, recently. And that there are still states where once you are a felon, you never have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. I'm here in Tennessee with the governor last Thursday. Bill Lee signed a law without anyone knowing about it that if you occupy, like sit in yep. or camp on the grounds of the state capital or other state property, public property, that you will be charged with a felony and six year sentence of convicted and permanently denied the right to vote. Yeah. But, but that's just a new thing. It exists in other states as well. There's also the issue of the disenfranchised under this demonization of undocumented as or immigrants and prisoners as you don't have the right to vote because you're illegal. 17 million permanent residents, the ones who have the green card, as they call it, who have legal residency, but don't have the right to vote. 17 million. My mother was one of them. She died three years ago, but she came to the U.S. at 21, died at 87, at 60 six years of never, never having voted. And she, if, talk about someone who had the right to vote. She raised six kids, she worked, she paid, she had every element except that little category. <clears throat> 11 million undocumented workers who don't have any rights and who are feeding us today. All of us, all the fruits and vegetables in California, Florida, everywhere, they're the undocumented workers. And then the packing houses as well. They have no rights and there's no talk about them having rights right now. I think if, I think if we had the right to talk to the public about this and say, and show them, I've interviewed some of them and say, look at them, how hard they work and how, how amazingly resilient they are, 13, 14 hours and proud of the work that they do and say, we are the ones that nobody else will do that work. They say that all the time. If people saw them on TV, they'd be like, of course you should have rights. I want to eat and you should eat too. And you should have the same rights I have. It's all a matter of getting to the people and having that bully pulpit on TV. Um, there is a 5 million prisoners or ex-prisoners. I've, I've talked to so many people, Arkansas, Texas, everywhere. They go, no, no, I can't vote. I'm sorry. They feel apologetic. I go, oh, oh, why not? Usually it's a man, white or black. And they go, I'm a felon. As if it's a mark on your life, the rest of your life. I think prisoners should be allowed to vote. Yeah. I think yeah. everyone should be allowed to vote. I think 16-year-olds should be allowed to vote. So that, right there, right there, Thurella, 35 million people, more than 10% more than of the population, 
but a much larger percentage of the voting age population, including teenagers, who I think are more intelligent than a lot of the adults. They have more, they have more sentiments of humanity and, 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 and have just, a, they're not as jaded, you know, they haven't gone into the, into the real world yet. Anyway, all those people would be a big demographic change in voting, voting for the things that are right, voting for the right to a job and housing because they're the ones who are the most exploited. That's the issue of voting, about voting, you know, pr proportional representation. Those are all good ideas, but those are, those are models of a parliamentary system, for example, in Europe and other countries. Countries that say, if you had a percentage of the vote, you will have percentage in the Congress. That, that works in other countries to a certain degree because it's, there's still capitalism. But in the United States, it's important to understand the history of the formation of the US electoral system in the formation of the constitution and this republic. And we know the history of those who couldn't vote until women finally fought for it, black people finally fought for it, native people finally fought for it and so on. But just on the essence of, um, and, and, and property owners only could vote. White men who didn't have property couldn't. But anyway, the electoral college is, the, is one of those perfect mechanisms of the checks and balances to say, we will always be able to control ultimately who gets to stay in power? Yeah. And so, sorry. You know, so, so, so it's interesting because Gore and Clinton, in key moments of their election, when they actually won the popular vote, you would think that the Democrats would have taken on that fight to get rid of the Electoral College, but actually, they don't want to get rid of it either. They yeah. don't want to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's time for Johnny to ask this question about the champion of the people. Johnny. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I did some research on you, Gloria. Um, I saw that uh, you've traveled multiple times to Venezuela and you're even pictured with Hugo Chavez. Can you tell us about your work there? You know, uh, was Chavez a, a dictator or was he a champion of the people of the indigenous people? Did he have support from the people? Well, God, thank you for that question. I also met many times with Fidel Castro. If you look, wow. if you look you'll find pictures of me with him, who yeah. is, my, is one of my heroes in my life, and hero to many tens of millions of people in the world. I think many more than that. And Hugo Chavez is too. He was a hero for me. I've also known Nicolas Maduro, the current president, since I met him in two, the year 2000. But and when he was a bus driver, I talked a few minutes ago about dictatorship because dictatorship is thrown around a lot. Oh, Fidel was always a dictator, and Putin's a dictator, and uh, the Soviet Union, Soviet leaders were dictators, and uh, certainly Hugo Chavez was a dictator, and Nicolas Maduro's a dictator. But you can't use those words without saying for which class. And I would say rather, the dictatorship of capitalism could be put in another way, capitalist democracy, dollar democracy, where the landlord has a right over the tenant, where the capitalist has a right over the worker and can fire them when they want. That's the, that's the democracy of the capitalists. The democracy of socialism is that the working class is in power on behalf of all the population, intellectuals, everybody, the farmers, the workers. And so when you are in a workers' democracy of Cuba and what they have in Venezuela, Venezuela is different though because Venezuela is still primarily a capitalist country but in a struggle for socialism. Right. We haven't been able to completely have a, a complete revolution but the unique part of Venezuela, it's very unique in terms of revolutionary history, is that the president is socialist. The Supreme Court is socialist. The military has been socialized. Uh, after the coup that was defeated under Chavez, the military was revamped and purged of the coup plotters that were working with the US. So it's a military 
that as an example to prove that, in 2019, last year, when the U.S. tried to inf invade the country with their supposed humanitarian aid, and I was on that border at that moment, hmm. I went there to Venezuela, took a 25-hour trip to the border, and witnessed it and made video from it. But anyway, um, the U.S., remember Trump said, you have one last chance to the Venezuelan military to defect, or you will regret it for the rest of your lives. He said that literally, and we'll give you money and so on. Maybe some 300 defected out of a, you know, more than a million soldiers. And the militias of now 4 million people, the civilians in militia, who are determined, you know, we may have a hard time right now, but we're going to defend our country from U.S. imperialism. It's been a process of education of the population. Hugo Chavez, I wrote about him. I have a long biography of him in an article when he died. But Hugo Chavez was from the roots of the poorest people of the country. And when he became a military man, he was two weeks older than me, by the way. We were all children of the 60s and the 70s. And he was influenced by, you know, the revolutionary movement of Cuba. In the military, he formed a secret group of soldiers. And his view was, we can't live like this anymore. Because he was a poor person and he was for justice. So he took on the military in 1992. That night when he surrendered after one day of battle with his men, he went on TV and said, I take full responsibility. We were trying to bring justice to the population, but we have to stop for now. And I'll tell you, the people who were alive at that time said, for now, he said, for now. He was in prison, but the president was forced to give him amnesty after two years. How do you do that? Was it a good president or was it the masses were demanding it? The masses were following Chavez. Here he is, a poor man, a soldier, unknown to the population, but that one act that he did in taking on the government, he became a national hero and became president. So what happened with Chavez's presidency was the greatest shock to the United States since the Cuban revolution because the U, the the Venezuelans are sitting on the largest source of oil in the world. I was just recently at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. I was doing research there. And you look into the post-World War II, look at the CIA dis undis I mean, disclosed documents that show that one of the main countries they were worried about was Venezuela because they had the largest amount of oil. They recognized it then. And so the US had the CIA fully embedded in Venezuela until Chavez's victory. It's why they tried to overthrow him three years later. It's why they sabotaged the oil industry and shut it down for five months. It's why they've been trying over and over. It's why they stole all of Venezuela's oil in the United States, the Sitco properties. It's why 14, 14 European and US imperialist banks hold all the gold of Venezuela and refuse to release it. And then they give us pictures in the New York Times and say, Oh my God, they're starving. Oh my God, they have no medicine. And they have these trumped up staged photos. And I've been in, Cuba, I've been in Venezuela 16 times since Hugo Chavez's victory. And I'm a videographer, I'm a journalist. And I have talked to many people. And I'll tell you, they're ready, they're ready to defend their country no matter what. But the danger of assassination of Nicolas Maduro is very great the danger of U.S. invasion, and the danger of all the paramilitaries that are right now hidden in different parts of the country. And in Colombia, that, that fascistic President Duque, who is doing everything he can to help overthrow the Venezuelan revolution because yeah. he fears for his own country what that example could mean. Yeah. And I'm just saying this, it's a long explanation, but Obama again, was the first one to apply the, the sanctions, declaring yep. Venezuela a national security threat yep. in March 2015. And so it's not the president, it's not the man or the woman, it's not the president, it's not the party, it's the system, it's capitalism, it's imperialism. So I just have a follow up on that really quickly. Um, uh, Lat Latinos, who a lot of them, who came from Cuba, who came from Venezuela, who come from Latin America, are somehow entirely against communism. 
So this is a question more so for my father, who might be watching, who's against communism <laughs> on its, in its entirety. Um, what, what, what do you say, what is your opinion on, on how a lot of the Cuban Americans, the Venezuelan Americans, other Latin Americans are so against the idea of communism that they can't talk about it and they say, well, I live there, I know what it's like. You don't want that. What do you say to those people? Well, they should look at my videos of uh, interviewing <laughs> Venezuelans on the ground in Venezuela from their own voices. They're very powerful. But I say this about Venezuela in particular right now. Yeah. <clears throat> Up until now, and still today, 99.9% .9 of Venezuelans in the U.S. are people with money. Um, some people with a lot of money. Yep. And of the upper middle class, if you can afford to fly to, Venice, to the U.S. from Venezuela and pay for your child to go to school, you are very wealthy. And that's what a lot of them are. I went on a national tour last year after I came back from that month being in Venezuela during the big U.S. aggression, including five days of the blackout I was there. And I went on a tour of 50 cities in the U.S. And almost everywhere, Venezuelans would come to try to disrupt uh, threaten, break it up. And they were almost all entirely youth who were studying in the U.S. or wealthy families. And um, poor Venezuelans don't live here. Maybe a handful, but not really. And in Cuba, the, the, the hundreds of thousands who left Cuba at the time of the revolution in the first two or three years were absolutely the ruling class. They were the bourgeoisie, they were the landowners, they were the bankers, they, were, they owned all the capital. The US owned all the capital, they were the junior partners. And so of course they were against it. But the demographics in Miami, the largest population of all, has changed greatly. Your father's Latino, I presume, I don't know if he's yeah. from the US or, yeah. or what. But, but the, thing, the thing about the Latino community is that the Spanish media which most Latinos who speak primarily Spanish in the U.S. listen to Spanish radio. And the Spanish radio is very right-wing when it comes to international politics. And people like Jorge Ramos, oh. the Univision reporter, who's just horrific. He's pro-immigrant, <laughs> but he's really anti-Cuba. And he's, he's also a liar, by the way. Big-time liar. Yeah. When it comes to Cuba and Venezuela, he's created a lot of false narrative. But anyway... P the Latino community listens to that and they go, but he says, but he says, and he's for immigrant rights. This is some of the challenges we have in the media. I, yeah. I want to tell you, I visited four prisons in Venezuela while I was there. I had this great privilege and I got into those prisons, men and women, and the transformation, the radical transformation, humanization of the inmates is dramatic. It happened under Chavez. It began under Chavez, but most of it was under Maduro. And these prisoners themselves talked to me alone or in groups and they'd say, it was a horror before, it was a nightmare. And Chavez and Maduro made it different for us. I wish I could share a video to you right now of one of those inmates who says, I wish the US would just let us be. Because Chavez, she goes, it, first she goes, first it was God, then it was Simon Bolivar, then it was Chavez, and now it's President Maduro. And these are words of people who are in prison. And mm. as far as Cuba, no one can deny that the blockade has been absolutely severe against the people of Cuba. And since the 90s, when the Soviet Union collapsed and they faced the greatest test of all of the Cuban revolution, and it survived. It survived two US laws that just almost strangled the population. And many people left during that time on the rafts. They weren't fleeing political repression. They were fleeing a difficult situation. But 11 million people stayed in their country and rebuilt it to being a, a social powerhouse with thousands of doctors around the world providing health care for free, saving people from the COVID. The, the, the marvels that they've created of almost 100% literacy and not just literacy, but intelligent understanding of the world that they live in. I think it's final uh, since Gloria Larriva says uh, Chavez is a champion of the people. He's a champion of the people. And uh, 
Uh, I, what's the name of that sanctions movie? Can we put that up, Johnny? What, because we had Tulsi Gabbard on our show uh, and, and asked her about sanctions. And she said, there's not even a mechanism that goes through Congress where they can see the actual effects of sanctions and how they really affect the poor. And also Mike Gravel has called them uh, an act of war. And the yeah. other day I was arguing with my mom and, you know, she's a Trumper that believes, well, hey, you know, sometimes sanctions are necessary and they're not. And you were talking about them years ago and people still, still don't grasp. They look at sanction as the compromise. Hey, we won't go to war with you. We'll sanction you. then. But how devastating are they? And, you know, what should we do to address that and make people realize that sanctions are no joke? As Ramsey Clark and even Fidel Castro said, they're more deadly than a nuclear bomb. Because a million people died in Iraq. And my video didn't show the worst part of it. My video, I intended in my video on Iraq not to show the things that would just crush people and make them seem like I never want to ever do anything again. I'm, it was intended to show how terrible it was, but also what they could do to fight back. We were able to raise millions of dollars of medicine that we, that we accompanied of uh, defying the blockade of Iraq through Jordan and into the country with millions and millions of pills of medicine and other needs that they had. But anyway, um, everybody in my video died. And they died, oh. within, they died within days. Everybody I saw in the hospitals was on death's door. And if you, if, if you, if you saw my video, your mother would change. It's still hard to talk about, but I'll tell you. Years ago, I showed that, I made it in 1998. And years ago, I showed it at the San Francisco State University. And, you know, people were shocked by it and angry and I want to do something. And this young man came up to me and he said, I came here to protest you. I was going to really denounce you. He said, he says, because I was in the army and I was in Kuwait. He said, I had no idea what we did. I had never seen this before. And he was shocked and angry. And that's what the first war did. And the second war, you see a recent poll of so many soldiers who say, what you see this, you see articles now. Now, after the damage is done in Afghanistan and Iraq, like, what were we there for? There's a story in, I think, the New York Times, major story of a man who had two sons, and he was gone most of, the, of his, those boys growing up years in Afghanistan, and he was gung-ho, gung-ho. He got really seriously injured. And after all these years and sees, you know, all this for naught, he said, what was this all about? It's like Vietnam and the awareness of the Vietnamese soldiers, the U.S. soldiers in Vietnam who became the biggest anti-war and so many others who are silent here or silenced. There are many who are anti-war right now. You never see them against these wars going on right now. They're a powerful voice. And I'm sorry for getting emotional, but it's really okay. hard. You, you have to see my video. Now, I made it analog. It wasn't even digital. And it's out there, but it's it's poor quality, but you can see enough. You can see enough of it. And then my video of Yugoslavia is the same way. It's called NATO Targets Venezuela. It's available on liberationnews.org. You just have to key in NATO Targets and you'll see it. Yes. And it's interesting because um, it's astounding how in the time of Iraq under Saddam Hussein, in these 12 years of sanctions, I interviewed rich people, I interviewed middle class, and I interviewed the poorest of the poor. Everywhere, I was unrestricted, a translator, and I would ask them the questions that people ask, and they were just livid with those questions. Like, don't you remember Vietnam, what you did to those people? Or like, this is a government that helps us. Now, to be sure, there was an opposition, but I think the majority of people um, were way better off under, under the 
Iraqi government before the U.S. destroyed it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And my video shows some of that. Short little, short little history about yeah. how before, before not Saddam Hussein, but before the 1958 revolution, which made it a republic from a kingdom that the U.S. imposed, that there was virtually, there was really basically no doctors or dentists for the population, no education. And once the oil, which is the key to really why the U.S. hated Iraq under Saddam Hussein, was that with the nationalization of the oil in 19, um, the full nationalization in 1972, and the building of a highway system, and free education, and free health care, and free medical schools for anyone who came into the country. I was there during the, the depth of the sanctions in 1998, and we visited the university students, and they said, we heard that the university students of the U.S. have to pay for their education. Yes, and they go, we not only have free education, we get an income so we don't have to work. And that was during the sanctions. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, thank you so much, Gloria, for being here. Just one last thought. Uh, on Julian Assange, would you pardon Julian Assange? Absolutely. And I would give immediate freedom to Leonard Peltier and Matula Shakur and Jalil Montaquim and Dr. Uh, Reverend Joy Powell and Mumia Abu Jamal, all these people who really have, are in prison for decades because, um, because they were resisting the empire. And I want to say one thing about Leonard Peltier. He was my original vice presidential candidate. He's Native American. Please look up the movie Incident at Oglala, O-G-L-A-L-A. And understand that he's one of the main victims of the U.S. war on Native people in this country. He had to resign from the ticket. He said he believes it ever more than ever, but he had to resign because he's facing a very, very tough health challenge right now, and he couldn't continue. So freedom for the prisoners, not just the political ones, but the people who really don't belong in prison, which is the majority of the people in prison, the vast majority. Yeah. And the others who are in prison because, you know, maybe they'd be a major danger to society. And I'm not talking about the ones that have been demonized for being poor economic victims. They shouldn't be mistreated. Prison is simply confinement to prevent a future crime. And the biggest prevention of crime is jobs, housing, health care. But yeah. people in prison yeah. should not be tortured where they are. <laughs> Isolation, 24-hour lights, tasering extraction teams, poor, ha poor ha food, no health care, COVID. We say no state execution by COVID-19. And I think maybe you want to end it now, but thank you so much for the chance. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I think I'm going to vote for you. I think you got right now, like, you know, there's a few more things I wanted to discuss. I know I said we can go on for three hours. Uh, I'm a civil liberties guy. I would probably want to talk more than that. But the fact that you said, You'll pardon Assange. And I mean, there's a lot more to talk about that and um, even more to dive into about our elections. But right now, uh, I think that you are pretty much my candidate in uh, California that I'm going to vote for. I really mean that. I love your whole uh, ideology, your perspective on on race, on economics and how we come together. Uh, so I'm going to just say me personally, Gloria, so far, I think you got my vote. Oh, I thank you very much, because. It takes courage to say that in these times, but I think it's important. Thank you. And really, you. I so appreciate I love the conversation. I hope it didn't touch too much. No, you're no, great. No, not at all. It was not awesome. Thank you so much, yeah. guys. All right. Thank you guys for watching. Um, thank you, Gloria. Combo out. Thank Bye, you. everybody.